You remember a while back, with both Otaku no Video and Welcome Back Mr. McDonald, how we said that we were detecting a trend with the requests coming our way from YouTube user ChanEX? Well, if those first two episodes didn't make it apparent, this one ought to. That's right, ChanEX, this one's for you, buddy. Today we're talking about another film that's meta and self-referential as hell, Mitsuo Yanigimachi's 2006 effort, Who's Camus Anyway? Who's Camus Anyway is available in the US on DVD from Film Movement. Additionally, it's currently streaming on Amazon Prime in the US. Unfortunately, the film has not received an official release in the UK or Australia, but there appears to be a Korean DVD version which is region free. We would recommend streaming the film or picking up a copy before proceeding. We won't want to spoil much until the end, at which point we'll give you fair warning. So either way, continue at your leisure. The film revolves around a somewhat disgruntled former filmmaker who has become a professor, Nakajo, whose students are working on producing a film for their university course. Most of the cast is made up of young up-and-comers, but a few familiar faces pop up. Notably, we see our friend from Takashi Miike's Black Society trilogy, Tomoro Taguchi, here turning in his gun and manic action scenes for a goatee in a role as a 35-year-old college student. For the most part, we follow the surprisingly large cast of characters through the trials and tribulations of pre-production, exploring the week before shooting is set to commence. The lead, who is to play a murderer, has dropped out, and an effeminate young man from the university's theater takes over his role. We follow him through rehearsals, clothes fittings, script readings, among other things, while also following the director and all the other crew through their actions in pre-production, as well as their personal lives on and off set. The American TV show Seinfeld has been called a show about nothing, but the comedy club bookends of each episode clearly display how it is interested in how a comedian gathers his or her material from his or her personal life. In much the same way, Who's Camus Anyway is sort of a film about nothing, but one which explores how the personal lives of the cast and crew on a film draw from their own experiences in the creation process. Sure, we could talk about any of the multitudes of subplots, like how the lead actor may or may not have been sexually abused when he was younger, or how Professor Nakajo lusts after one of the young students he sees around campus, or how the director of the film within the film is extorting money from an obsessed stalker, while also sleeping around with other crew members. There's a lot going on within the film, and yet none of these plot threads really see proper resolution. Instead, they coalesce into a patchwork hole that has left critics decidedly on one side or the other. Either the film is a boring mess, or it's a genuine masterpiece. If nothing else, Who's Camus Anyway fits perfectly with Chani X's other suggestions, in that it's a loving ode to what is nearest and dearest to the hearts of those behind it. In this case, the art of film production. To understand Who's Camus Anyway, then, we ought to examine the primary figure behind the film, Mitsuo Yanagimachi. I would take a gamble and say that Yanagimachi is likely most well known for his first feature film, 1976's Godspeed You Black Emperor. This monochrome documentary is so renowned that it inspired the name of the Canadian post-rock band. It's also a striking film to the point that, despite scraping in at the tail end of the movement, Godspeed has led some to label Yanagimachi as one of the last true New Wave directors to hail from Japan. It's the stark portrait of the Black Emperors, a notorious biker gang of the era, and a film which I'm genuinely surprised we haven't covered on the show yet. Throughout the following three decades, Yanagimachi's filmography is, well, it's all over the place. Beginning as an early independent, Yanagimachi dabbled in studio production from time to time, working on both big and small-scale projects, some of which received contemporary attention outside of Japan, while others never truly left the country. Of the seven fiction films he has directed, Yanagimachi penned the scripts for six, providing a consistent voice to his body of work in spite of these other variables. In the 1990s, between films, he taught at Waseda University for three years, which inspired him to make a film with students rather than actors. After working to outline the relationships between the many characters in Who's Commute Anyway, Yanagimachi spent 10 years producing and refining the script. This could account for the decade gap between this film and his previous effort. Given how meta this film about filmmaking was destined to become, Yanagimachi imbued the screenplay with references not just to his teaching days, 
but also to his numerous influences in film. He specifically stated in an interview that the complex, multi-sided nature of the film's characters was inspired by the works of Francois Truffaut, but references abound in the film to other directors as well. The opening of the film, which is one uninterrupted shot clocking in at just under seven minutes, pays deliberate homage to the opening of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, as well as Alexander Sokorov's 96-minute single-shot film Russian Ark, and to the works of Kenji Mizoguchi, most notably his adaptation of The 47 Ronin. All of this we know because of the several university students we observe partaking in an especially on-the-nose conversation about these three films and their respective shot lengths. Later, we get numerous references to other filmmakers like French New Wave master Jean-Luc Godard. We also get some prominent literary references, like To Death in Venice by Thomas Mann, which follows an author dealing with writer's block who falls in love with a young woman. Another prominent example is the pervasive inclusion of references to The Stranger by Albert Camus, a popular novel which deals with existential questions and absurdism. Professor Nakajo is frequently compared to the lead character in Mann's novel given his status as a former filmmaker and his interest in a young woman. Around the time of the film's release, Yanagimachi admitted that he would likely be compared to Nakajo given his own absence from film for the decade preceding its release. What's more, the similarities extend to Yanagimachi wanting to film Who's Camus Anyway on the campus of Waseda University, where he had taught for three years in the 90s. He could not secure the filming rights, however, and production was moved to Rikyo University instead. Now, this is the part where we're going to be getting into spoilers concerning the film's conclusion. So if you don't want it spoiled, jump to the time on screen where we'll be past this point. Otherwise, if you don't care, or if you've seen the film, let's get into it. We would argue that the main message behind Who's Commute Anyway, beyond all of these references and beyond all of the talk of film production, is the magic that cinema creates. Up until the final 10 minutes or so of the film, we're observing the process of film production by the students of the university. We see one iteration after another, how the film evolves from script to screen, and then at the end we finally see the first day of shooting. At this point, we're not really clear on who we can believe or who to trust, given that all the characters have some sort of hang-up, or have lied to someone at this point. But the characters and scenarios we've seen are so real that we're buying into them, whether we realize it or not. On the first day of shooting, we see the crew filming the murder scene, which is central to their entire film. However, the manner in which the sequence is cut leads us to believe that the actor, who has been hinted is mentally unstable, has swapped the play knife for a real one and murdered the old couple for realsies. It's not until the final shot, where he runs from the house where he leaves their corpses, that we again see the camera crew and we're assured non-verbally that the murders were in fact fake. This whole sequence is friggin' brilliant, because it shows that Yanagimachi and his crew know how to effectively manipulate their audience. It's one of those conclusions to a film where, upon reflection, you realize that the puzzle pieces were all there, but subtle enough that you were tricked into believing something different. Earlier, we see the prop knife brought on set. After this, we see the cast and crew roughhousing, play acting for fun, but in a manner that we're not sure we should take seriously. During the murder scene, we're clued into what is part of the film that we're watching and what is part of the film that they are producing, given the presence or absence of the crew. See, here we're watching the crew, so we know the violence is fake. Here, on the other hand, there's no crew, so we think we're watching an actual murder, while in fact we're watching the film within a film. Here, our expectation that this murder is real infects our view of the production, so we think he's killing the woman while the crew films it passively. You get the idea. It's a brilliant subversion of expectation, and practice in audience manipulation that shows Yanagimachi's effectiveness as a storyteller, and his awareness of his own medium. As early as the opening, during the on-the-nose conversation we brought up before, one of the students comments that the shots discussed in the other films are trick shots. Rather than being a single take, they are several shots cut together to look seamless. Whether or not this is the case with the opening of Who's Camus Anyway, this dialogue is included to introduce the idea to us early on that the film has a certain magic, with filmmakers being modern magicians. Once we hear this, we're looking throughout the remainder of the scene for any places where cuts could exist. Perhaps we play back the film and watch from the beginning. 
The point is to both captivate with the impressive cinematography, but also to call attention to it. Some would probably call this masturbatory and unnecessary, but that's exactly the type of film that Who's Camus Anyway is. It was created in reverence to the art of filmmaking. Just like Chan EX's other suggestions up to this point, it's a love letter to the creator's chosen medium. It's not necessarily pretentious, because it doesn't look down on those who won't get the references present throughout to classic film. Hell, we probably missed more than our fair share of them, but it's not trying to condescend. Rather, the film is intended to act as a form of fan worship for the art of film. Is it self-indulgent? You bet. Is it overly complicated? Absolutely. But it was crafted with such patience and love for what the creators were doing that it would be hard to argue that it's vapid. For all of these reasons, Who's Camus Anyway is certainly not a film for everyone. If you fancy yourself a film buff, or if you're as fascinated as we are by the behind-the-scenes goings-on of film production, give it a watch as you'll likely get something out of it. If you're a more passive viewer who won't appreciate something so mental and cerebral, however, you might want to give this one a pass. Mitsuo Yanagimachi has had a strange and varied career, from his early days in monochrome documentary with the Ruffians of Tokyo, to the self-serving film on display today, one can never be certain what he might turn out. Unfortunately, Who's Kimu Anyway is Yanagimachi's final film to date, and only his eighth film overall. But with 13 years now having passed since the film's debut at the Cannes Film Festival, making this his longest absence from film to date, perhaps it means that we can expect another project of his coming down the pipeline sooner than later.